Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Women in Leadership Talk podcast. I'm Vicki Bradley, your host, and super excited today. I have Barbara DeBerry here with us, and Barbara, welcome. We're so glad to have you. Thank you, Vicki. I'm very excited to be here. Awesome. Well, we're thrilled to have you, and I want to thank our audience, because I know you have a, a choice as to what podcast you listen to, and we appreciate you you know, looking at Women in Leadership Talk as your go-to podcast, and, and you get to learn a lot from amazing women leaders, and you're going to hear about that today as we speak with Barbara. So let me officially introduce Barbara um, to our audience. Barbara is a long-term care specialist and a financial advisor with Northwestern Mutual in Durham and North Carolina. Love that area. Love North Carolina. <laughs> Her practice focuses on protecting the family relationships, financial security, and legacies of her clients through long-term care planning. Barbara is passionate about long-term care planning, and she integrates into a holistic financial plan. Her personal extended care experiences within her family, as well as those of her clients, have strengthened her commitment to widespread education for consumers and their advisors. Prior to joining Northwest Mutual in 1996, she worked for 11 years in the banking industry as a commercial lender and private banking manager. She is a member of the steering committee of the Dementia Inclusive Durham and is the facilitator for Memory Matters, which is a resident support group at Crowsdale Village. She's been married to Tad for 30 years and they have two daughters who I'm sure are just thriving. <laughs> and she also graduated from University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill with a BS in business administration. Barbara is a native of Asheville, North Carolina. Love all the, the area you're in, Barbara. I absolutely love it. So thrilled to have you here today. So officially want to welcome you. Um, and, you know, I'm super grateful for you coming on to the podcast today and sharing your experiences um, I know when I met you, I was just blown away with your story and what led you down this path. And so I'm excited for our audience to, you know, hear your story, but also learn a few things about how they can approach long-term care planning. So I'm going to be quiet for a minute. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Shocking, I know, but I'd love for you to just, you know, share your story as to what's led you to this path. Hmm. I'd be happy to. And I think as is typical of individuals who have a business that they're passionate about, it usually is due to family experiences they've had or personal experiences. And mine is no exception. So um, back in 2009, my life was turned upside down. My dad was an estate planning attorney. He was very, very active in his community he was larger than life. Everyone who knew my dad adored my dad. And very suddenly in his early 70s, he became quite ill and it impacted him physically as well as cognitively. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, huge decisions had to be made. Um, you may remember in 2009, the stock market had just crashed mm -hmm. and the real estate market had just crashed by about 40%. So when you're making big financial decisions at that time, it, they were even harder. So I found myself in a position of having to make medical decisions, financial decisions, um, care decisions, all sorts of things from three hours away. I was very blessed that I had two people in the Asheville area who adored my dad and took care of all the daily stuff. Without that, I don't know what would have happened. Mm -hmm because I was running my own business, had two kids in middle school, was on three boards. I was living the life of a normal, successful 40-something-year-old woman. And as I was going through the hardest time in my life, the person that I would normally would have picked up the phone and called and said, what should I do about this or that? It was my dad that I would have called, and I was asking questions about him. So this was without a doubt the hardest time of my life. And I decided when he passed away in 2011 that I wanted to take that horrific experience and turn it into something positive by helping other families start thinking actively about long-term care and how to plan appropriately for it. Yeah. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. And, and I know that had to have been a, a just a horrible time in your life. Yeah. Um, but I'm super grateful for you, you know, turning something that was not 
good yeah. and pleasant into something that we can all learn from as well. And, you know, there, there's, and I think you and I talked about this before, Barbara, people have this hesitation to even think about it. Right. I think I shared with you my own mother. She's like, no, if we don't talk about it, then it won't happen. Right. And there's this mental and emotional resistance to want to talk about long-term care. And so um, that's why I thought this was such an important topic for you to share with us. And so, you know, one thing you already started about was even having local support, right? I mean, I'm 12 hours away from my mom and I'm managing her care from Canada. Uh, and, And so would love for you to just tap into how do you even begin? So I highly recommend that we begin before anybody ever needs care, because if we're if we're doing it once the care is needed, we have limited options. So let's take it back 10, 15, 20 years before that need occurs. Um, So I think that what people need to realistically think about is, number one, it's going to happen. There's about a 50 percent chance if we make it to 65 that we're going to need care. So if you happen to be married then that means either you or your spouse will probably have to deal with this, which means there's almost 100% chance that your kids are going to have to deal with this. Mm -hmm. So we may not feel it right now. We may not want to think about it right now because we don't want to be ever dependent upon anybody else to help us with day-to-day activities. And we don't even want to think about aging. I'm turning 60 in January and I'm mind boggled by that. There's something 59, 60, there's a big difference there. So I get why people don't want to talk about it, but the impact is so dramatic on the people that we absolutely love the very most that we just, we can't put this off any longer. So we need to start thinking about it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I totally agree with you. Um, and, and it is that emotional and mental shift into how do you start planning? And so Maybe we, you know, even have that, let's start with that part of the discussion is how, where do you begin? Where, where, you know, we need to have the conversation, but where do we begin? Right. So to set kind of a timeline first, um, my husband and I actually started planning when we were 37. We started planning at that point, not really knowing what we were doing, but knowing if there was ever a situation, especially when we were young, where we were in an accident or we suddenly became very ill, the healthy spouse would have to stop everything career-wise and take care of the spouse, the kids, the home, everything. It would have ruined us financially. Um, And so being a financial planner, that was just something that we took on at that age. Um, Most of the time, people are thinking about it in their 50s. And the reason they're thinking about it in their 50s is because their parents are starting to have some issues. They're seeing the impact on the family and they're thinking, hmm, I want to protect my children so they don't have the same experience. So the way that I've now found that people can plan is through a bit of an epiphany that I had in late 2017. And it's really the way I help people do long-term care planning now. So will you let me tell the story? Yes, please. I'm anxious for you too. (laughs) Okay, good. I hope I don't let you down. No, you um, won't never. (laughs) I was thinking about what long-term care planning really is beyond just a discussion with family or just writing a list of if this, then that, what you want to have happen. And I decided that a long-term care plan would be a letter. So I sat down and I wrote a letter in my father's voice to myself. Um, and it was six years after six or seven years after he died. So I know that sounds a little weird, but it actually worked. So I sat down and it said, dear Barbara, the reason I'm writing you this letter is because when your grandparents, as they age, they needed care. And this is how it affected me. This is how it affected your mom. My parents were divorced. This is how it affected your aunts and uncles. And it impacted us physically, emotionally, financially. Here's the story. And it amazes me now how few families are sharing family history. You know, I think generations ago, we did a great job of that. But now that's kind of stopped. Some people don't even know their grandparents, don't even see them because they're so spread apart or maybe in a different country. And so this gave me an opportunity through my dad's voice to just share some family experiences, which were good. 
And so after he shared that family care experience, the next paragraph went on to say, if I ever need care, this is what I would like it to look like. So he said he really wanted to stay in his current home, which was a townhouse that he loved. He said, but realistically, there are five steps to get into it. And there may come a point in time when I can't do those five steps anymore. And if that's the case, then I want to move to this particular retirement community. And here's why. Next paragraph. If I stay at home, this is about what it costs for me to live comfortably at home right now. And if I needed somebody to come in and help me with day-to-day -day activities that I couldn't do myself, it would cost about this amount. And just for your own edification, it costs about $25 an hour to have somebody come in your home, a CNA, and help with these activities. So if you had somebody for about eight hours a day, that's going to be about $6,000 a month, which $6,000 a month for a few months may not be a big deal. But if it was for a long period of time, $6,000 a month is a lot of money. Sure. So in the paragraph, it said, here are my current expenses, and here's how much it would pay to have somebody come in, how much it would cost to have somebody come in and help me. If I move to this particular retirement community, then it's going to cost about this amount. Mm -hmm. Next paragraph. Here's how I want to pay for that. I bought insurance. It will cover this amount. This is how it works, et cetera. If it's insufficient, I want you to use this particular asset to make up any difference in cost of care. Okay. I hope you will never touch that asset because it's one that I really want to pass on to you and your sister and your grand and my grandchildren. And that third asset, you and your sister really don't have a personal attachment to. I do. And I know there's going to come a day if you ever have to sell it where there's going to be great angst about it because you're going to wonder, would dad allow me to do this? Would I have his okay? I'm telling you right now, it's okay to sell it. And then the next paragraph, it said, you know what? This is my best laid plan. I guarantee it's going to look different from this. I know that it's going to be messy. I know that when you tell me I have to move out of my house and give up my keys, I am going to say things to you that I can't imagine saying to you. And I'm going to treat you in ways that may just be quite appalling to us both. I want to tell you right now that I am so sorry. I want to apologize for that in advance. And I want to tell you that I love you and I trust you. And what's most important is that you just be the best wife to Tad and best mom to my two granddaughters that you can be. Love Dad. And that was a long-term care plan. Wow. <laughs> and I knew that it had impact when I went to a conference a couple months later and I had that letter in my bag and a man just randomly in between sessions said, so what is it you do for a living? And I told him and I said, and I, I have this new approach to long-term care planning. Would you read something? And he said, sure. And so I handed the letter over to him and he read it and he cried. And I don't mean just a little trickle. I mean, he cried and he said, now I know what I'm going to do on my flight back to New Jersey tomorrow. I'm going to write a letter to my family. And that's when I knew this is powerful and people can relate to it. So um, I'm now encouraging people far and wide. And thankfully, thanks to you, um, I'm able to reach out to even more people to encourage them to start going through this process. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I have to admit, I did get, and that's the second time I've heard your story and I got emotional just as you were sharing that, because especially the part about the message about things that'll be said, um, because, you know, people want their independence as long as possible and you get that, right. You put yourself in those shoes, but there does come a time when decisions have to be made and, and that's hard. That's really hard. But I think what I've taken from your conversation, Barbara, is that importance of people understanding what it is you desire. If you, you know, when you come to that point in time in life and that the person who's executing it, who's been the person they trust to execute it really knows that they are 
honoring that person's wishes. Um, I think that's the part that's so important. So I guess a couple of questions I have. So what do you do in the situation where you may come to that time where that person has to let go of their home, whether it be financial or from care, um, you know, and there's a lot of resistance there. Maybe that care letter says, never, I want to die in this location. You know, how do you, how do you handle that? Yeah, it's tough. And I want to go back and make sure that I share with you with this letter. First of all, it needs to be written in your own handwriting, not typed as we all do, because there's something exceedingly personal about handwriting. Um, secondly, it's a letter that needs to be shared, not just go with your go-to kid, um, which probably most of your listeners are the go-to kids. Yes. <laughs> um, so it's not just shared with that person. It's shared with everybody. It's shared with all the siblings so that while everybody is happy and healthy and communicative, mm -hmm. um, they can ask questions and they can say, well, where do I fit in and why this asset and why not that asset? And just go ahead and air all of that now. Yeah. And then as parents' lives change and adult children's lives change, then you update the letter because it's a living, breathing document. It's not a legal document. You don't have to go to your, to your attorney. Um, update it, talk about it again, so that by the time care is needed and you have to move out of that house, the rest of the family can say, you know what? We've been talking about this stupid letter for the past 25, 30 years. And if mom or dad were clear headed right now, they would agree that whatever step we're taking is the right step. Yeah. And I say all that because in your example, the letter says, do not move me out of this house, no matter what. And I would hope that when we have the family meeting, where we're discussing the letter, somebody raises their hand and says, mom or dad, I hear what you're saying. And we will do that if at all possible. We will we'll try everything that we can, but there may come a point in time when we can't do that anymore. And what's most important to you, as you've told us, is keeping these sibling relationships tight. And so, it would mean so much to me and to the rest of us if you would give us an idea of if we get to that point and we can't and you can't stay at home, mm -hmm. what our next step will be. Because if you don't, we're not going to agree with each other and our relationships are really going to be harmed. Mm. Oh, I love that. I love how you just described that because you're right. It's the aftermath, right? And, and it's forever. I mean, there yeah. are sibling relationships, you probably have seen them too, that are irreparable. And it's interesting, there's often one kid who lives nearby and they are responsible for checking in on mom and dad on a regular basis, taking them to doctor's appointments, basically being available at a moment's notice. And then you've got the other kids who are across the country who are passing judgment on what the local person is doing. No appreciation for what they're doing, just passing judgment. And then you have a successful sibling who maybe the local one may not. And everybody's thinking, you know what, if we're short on cash, we'll just go to that person. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe that'll work for a little while, but you need to understand that that successful person has some type of financial plan in place. And if money's being spent on mom and dad's care, now all of a sudden their retirement plans, their college education plans, charitable giving, all those things are thrown up in the air and they're resentful because just because they were successful, does that mean that they have to take over all the financial responsibilities? So it's complicated. And again, if we don't start having those conversations now and figure out who has what responsibility, there's going to be some resentment and frustration. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and that's so, so true. Um, and you see that you see that happening, like lots of people I know that are caring and they seem to tend to be the one that has all the responsibility. Um, but there's many factors that come into play with always, that. always. So, so, and you've probably experienced this, Barbara, but I'm, I'm just curious and maybe I'm laboring on it, but what happens? So, okay. So this is, I love the idea. So we have this letter, we've sat down, we've talked about it, but the person that um, 
you know, you're dealing with, the person who needs the care, they're really resisting talking about it or doing anything about it because they believe that if they talk about it, it's going to make it happen. Right. I know that sounds crazy, but I, I no, hear no, 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 no. I, I hear that a lot. Okay. I hear that a lot. And so it's, I don't have a perfect answer for it, but one strategy that I found that really seems to be working is we're talking about perhaps parents who are in their seventies or eighties who are not willing to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. We have adult children who are in their forties or fifties. Mm -hmm. The people that the 70 and 80 year olds love more than anybody on this earth are not their adult children. It's their grandchildren. Mm. And so if the adult children say mom and dad, this is something that we've been working on and we've written a letter for the benefit of your grandchildren whom you adore. Mm. We are hopeful that we can sit down with you and hope help you write your own letter. So I think leading by example is exceedingly powerful because it's not fair to ask somebody to do something that you wouldn't be willing to do yourself. Well, that's a great point. Absolutely. <laughs> And the other thing is, if there is no plan, these adult children are going to be jumping in and doing whatever needs to be done physically, financially, whatever. And the people that's going to most impact is I found out when I was going back and forth and dealing with my dad is it impacted my children. Mm -hmm. And it's going to impact these 70 and 80 year olds grandchildren. And that's the last thing in the world that they want. But that time that I was spending at home, focusing on how am I going to make all the financials work and driving to Asheville to meet with people to make other decisions, those were times that I was away from my daughters. And even if I wasn't doing those two things, I was doing all my other responsibilities. I was exhausted. Yeah. I wasn't eating right. I wasn't exercising. I was not the best me. And my middle school daughters deserve to have a mom who was totally engaged with them. That's a hard time. And even if it's elementary, high, high school, college, I don't care what it is. Um, we need to put our kids first, I think. Ourselves first, actually. And what then our kids, right? <laughs> Oxygen mask on ourselves. Exactly. And I wasn't doing that. Um, but helping your parents understand that if we can't address this now while you're healthy, it's going to have far reaching impact on everybody. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great point. Um, I, and I do think about that even for my own children, right? I think about, you know, I don't want to be that burden on them if that day comes, um, you know, and so how to orchestrate that, I admit, I haven't, I haven't uh, written my letter yet. <laughs> Which, okay. which you've just prompted me. I'm doing it. Good. There's still <laughs> time. On it. Yep. Yep. So, so I think the other thing that, you know, I'm curious about, and, and maybe because, you know, I live in a different country from my mother, um, but I see this also, you know, the children are further away um, yes. and, and, and grandchildren are further away. And so how, what are some of your tips for that personal self-care, uh, when you're trying to long distance manage someone's care, because, you know, in my particular situation, my brother is five hours away, I'm 12 hours away. Right. And, you know, that makes it difficult. And I am my mom's executor, I, I'm on her health and her finances. Um, but would love to hear some tips on, you know, how do we, how do we do that from afar? Absolutely. So in an ideal world, you're not afar. So I want to address that first. My mom saw what I went through with my dad. And again, they were divorced. And so soon after he died, she and my stepfather decided that they would move to my town while they were still happy and healthy so that as they aged, I would actually be local for them. And that would take a burden off of me. So that was the greatest gift she's ever given me. And it was a great gift to herself. And she brings that up all the time. So if there's a way to get them local while they're still healthy so that they can make friends here, yeah. wherever you are, um, as opposed to moving them when they're already infirmed or have dementia or whatever, much better to do it that way. If you are still going to be a part, and even if you're local, it's incredibly important to have a team of support. 
So there's the personal team, which is your family and your friends who will call you out on not taking care of yourself, who will say you are leaving your desk, you are coming out and taking a walk with me, or you are going to bed now, the computer's going off or whatever, right? You need to be told what to do because you are managing so much, you really need somebody to manage you. Um, so that's an incredible gift. Secondly, there are professionals who can help. So I have several colleagues that I refer clients to that are um, in our area, they're called daily money managers. Okay. Um, and there's a, um, uh, calling it an organization is not the right word, but um, you have to be licensed in order to be able to do that. But what that person is doing is paying the bills, um, looking through the mail, maybe once a week, you know, you get your mom to pile up the mail and then that person comes to the house, looks through the mail, gets rid of the junk mail, figures out what the bills are, make sure that they're paid, looks at the bank statements on a monthly basis or online, maybe on a weekly or daily basis to make sure that they're not being scammed or something like that, um, pulls together the information needed for the tax preparer. All of those things, yes, you're going to pay a fee for that. It's not a lot. Mm -hmm. And it is such a relief to know that it's being taken care of no matter what's going on in your life. Your mom's bills are still being paid. And then you're kept up to date on a regular basis as to what's going on. And they're fully bonded and everything else. So I think that's really key. The other thing, the other type of person that is exceedingly helpful is, and again, in different areas that call different things, um, but they are specialists in helping families figure out what care needs your parents may have. So they will come in and they will talk to the family and find out what are the family dynamics. Let's look at the house and make sure that it's safe. What levels of care do mom and dad need? And how do we find the right people to come in and provide that care? Or if some type of facility such as assisted living or skilled care is necessary, then they will help figure out which are the best ones based on budget, based on location, um, based on reputation, um, all those kinds of things, and then come back with a few suggestions as opposed to you having to go out and look at 15 different places. And by the time you get to number four, you've already forgotten what number one looked like. Mm, great point. So, and you have maybe 24 hours to figure it out. So these people will do this investigative work and then send um, the information to the family. And then they can also do regular, depending upon what your parents need, may come in on a monthly basis and do a checkup and then send a report out to all the siblings so that everybody's on the same page. Okay. We also have technology that's incredible now, which will allow you to have some video monitors in place so you can actually see what your parents are doing. You can see if they open the refrigerator to make sure that they're eating and drinking. You can see if they actually um, use their toilet or not. Um, very basic things, but if you just had an app where it popped up and said, yes, there's movement and it appears that they're doing okay, that gives you some peace of mind to keep going. Okay. And then you also need a neighbor. Your parents need to have a neighbor that you can call at any time and say, I haven't heard from mom and dad, or I just got this really strange call from mom. I think something might be going on. Would you please go check it out for me? And I think it's better not to have the neighbor be the same age as your parents, yeah. Um, because sometimes they kind of lie for each other, right? Sure, because sure. you want to cover it up. <laughs> yeah. Oh, mom looks great when in fact she doesn't. So you might want somebody in your own um, age range that is going to be real with you and say, yeah, it's time for you to get on the plane and come over here because something's not right. Okay. Okay. So it takes wow. a village is what I'm saying. Yeah. You those, by yourself. those are all really great suggestions. Um, and I think that, you know, some of the things you've described, there super important. Um, and even just recognizing what it's doing to you, right? Um, because yeah, to your point, the oxygen mask, put yours on first so that yeah. you can help others. Um, that's such an important message. Uh, and there was something that came to me when you were talking and then I just kind of lost it. <laughs> Thank you. I do that all the time. <laughs> I was like, oh yeah, I got to make sure I go back and ask her that. Um, you know, I, I, I think that a number of the things that you've discussed is, 
you know, super helpful, number one. Um, and also laying out that foundation so that you have peace of mind when the time comes, because then everybody is on the same page. Um, there's no guessing on, you know, what mom wants or doesn't want. And, and especially nowadays, I mean, you know, divorce rate is what, 58%. Um, so there's a lot of elder single yes. people who, you know, they don't necessarily want to admit that things are going on um, and they start to get defensive, right? As they age. And so it, well, I think it is- And they don't even realize there's something they going don't. on. Yeah, yeah, they don't, they don't. None of us do, right? Because we don't see yes. ourselves the way others see us. But such great, uh, great feedback on, yeah. you know, just how to navigate. And, and so, Barbara, I'm sure our audience is going to have more questions, um, you, even though you've given such a comprehensive overview. So where can people reach you if, you know, they want to talk about even in more detail how to, how to help? Maybe they have somebody who's reluctant to, to have that conversation or write the letter. How can they reach you? I would love for anybody to reach out. Just they can go through my website, which is just barbaradeberry.com. Okay. Um, or is that something you're going to put up so they can see it? Um, I can. I can put or it. Or I can spell it out. You know what? I will put it in. Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure it goes out. Yes. Okay. That's awesome. barbaradeberry.com. And there'll be a place where you can, um, a link so that you can just send me an email and we can get started with a conversation. Um, So whether you talk to me or not, um, going to that website, you're going to have some resources, some things that you can think about. And then also, I just encourage everybody to please start actively having conversations with your family. Um, It can't happen soon enough. And the objective really is to allow someone to continue to have a voice when they no longer have a voice. Yeah, that's so important. It's hard to think about, but it's going to happen. Yeah, absolutely. No, you're right. It does happen. And sometimes things happen when we least expect it. So, you know, I, I want to emphasize this point that, you know, you could get, you know, in, a, in an accident or all of a sudden some disease comes up in, in you and you don't have to be elderly, but you should have these conversations yeah. with respect to care and, you know, what the plans are. Um, Correct. So, so, so my that, dad's, my dad's came completely out of the blue. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, it can happen to anybody and at any time. Yes, it can. It can. Well, Barbara, I want to thank you. Um, this has been amazing and really informative. And, you know, I know a big part of our audience, we have a good mixture of different ages and stages in life. And so I think the conversation we've had impacts all stages and ages. Um, and the sooner you start the conversation, the better. And, and again, to your point, it's a living document. So it's something that you can you know, update and change and modify as, as time goes on. Uh, but the important thing is to get started. I, that's what I'm taking away from the conversation. Correct. And I can't thank you enough for giving me this opportunity because I, I share this message one-on-one with as many people as I can, but you have such an incredible audience. You're allowing me to touch so many more lives at one time. And um, I'm forever grateful for that. Well, we are, we are grateful as well. So thank you. Um, and I want to thank our audience. You know, as I said earlier, you get to choose what uh, podcast you listen to. I think this one, you know, certainly gives you a lot of tips on how to get started. And, you know, directionally, it doesn't matter what country you live in and, and you're listening to this, I'm sure there are resources available um, that start to look at what those resources are locally to you. Uh, and I want, I, I want to thank you for joining us at Women in Leadership Talk, and we hope that you'll join us for our next podcast. Um, so everyone, thank you so much. Take care and I'm very grateful to you. Thank you, Vicki.